Okay. Okay. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're super excited to be here tonight, and I've been really looking forward to sharing this information with the team on uh, mast cell activation and just um, really looking at its significance in complex chronic health. Uh, my name's Ren Dubois, and I've got Jesse Johns here today, clinical nutritionist, and um, we're, we're just going to be exploring the parameters of this condition. Um, before I do that, though, I would like to do an acknowledgement to country, and um, I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of which this presentation is being delivered, the Arakal people of the Bundjalung Nation, and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to do a shout out to our team, our wonderful team who we have here this evening, and to just acknowledge the work that we're doing together. It isn't um, a one person show here, it's a collaborative uh, approach and the knowledge that we've got and the knowledge that we're sharing today is a, a combination of all the knowing and all the wisdom that we share every week, twice a week. Um, so a shout out to this amazing team. So um, first of all, I'd like to say that this talk was inspired by Dr. Lawrence Afrin. He's a hematologist and oncologist, and I had the absolute privilege of seeing him twice in the last six months. Now, this was not planned. There was some divine intervention that took place here. Um, and the first time I heard his work delivered, um, I couldn't quite believe what I was hearing. And I, I remember coming back and saying to the team, I saw this amazing presentation on mast cell activation. And I think he said this, and but then almost three months later, towards the end of my second round of COVID, I somehow turned up um, at a second lecture of his, and I was sitting there the whole lecture going, he did say that, he, he, he did say that. And for me, all the pieces of the puzzle fell together. Um, I've been working with complex chronic health for 25 years now, and there's a lot of pieces that I know they go together, but I haven't quite understood how. And I feel like this uh, understanding of how the mast cells work has really brought this together for me. So with this talk, we're going to cover what are mast cells and their action, uh, what symptoms mast cells can cause, uh, what are some of the 300 receptors that can trigger mast cells, uh, what are some of the signaling chemicals released? And there's believed to be over a thousand now, um, but there's 200 that are, are better known now. Um, what testing we have available in Australia to identify mast cell activation syndrome? What treatments we have available? Um, Jess is going to talk about dietary um, and lifestyle treatments, or mostly dietary. I'll be talking a bit more about lifestyle to consider when treating mast cell activation. And we've just got a couple of case studies peppered in to try and help bring the knowledge to you all that has just awoken my complex chronic health naturopathic brain and excited me. So first of all, uh, mast cells, when they're working properly, their main job is to initiate the immune system to defend and respond. Um, in the case of an infection, uh, their job is to recognise a sense of danger and to activate the mast cells to release their contents. This is called degranulation. And the contents that are released then get to work activating the required inflammatory responses in attempt to rid the body of that danger. Now, mast cell activation syndrome is a hypersensitivity reaction to the immune system. So it's these mast cells just over responding to the environment, to threats, but then also to things that aren't necessarily a threat. It can manifest with or without allergic reactions. So this was the first myth broken for me. I thought, well, they don't have a high IgE, uh, they're not itchy. Uh, is probably not mast cell activation. So that is not necessarily always the case, although it does present a lot of the time. Mast cell activation syndrome is a multi-systemic immune dysregulation. And it's we can narrow it down, and this is where the skill of the clinician comes in by understanding what mast cells, what part of the body they're presenting, what receptors are docking on these mast cells, 
and what mediators are being released into the system. And by understanding those three stages, we can start to really treat this syndrome efficiently and effectively. So um, as you can see, it affects multiple systems of the body, um, but mast cells are a specialised form of white blood cell and they concentrate at the entrances of the body. So the eyes, the nose, the ears, the throat, the esophagus, stomach, the, the genitals, all of these areas that are exposed to the environment all have mast cells sitting, waiting to respond to whatever's in the environment. But they're also present in the connective tissue throughout the body. Um, and they're abundant in those sites just slightly beneath those environmentally exposed parts of the body. And they um, are in the nearby blood, lymphatic system, and nervous system. And this explains a lot of the neurological symptoms we see. And I'll get into that more as we go on. Um, but one of the other biggest ahas around mast cell in, uh, activation is its effect on the nervous system. And it can, can become this vicious cycle. And I like this photo. I think, Jesse, you popped it in there for me. I really like it. Where mast cells line every nerve sheet and every nerve ending, and they release neurotransmitters. So they're responsible for the release of serotonin or dopamine, depending on what's going on at that end of the nerve sheet. Um, they can release histamine and cytokines if there's an infection, like in the sense of herpes, the herpes virus, and they can lead to this hyperactive signaling symptom. And it can become that the, the more the mast cells release, and it's a very stressful situation when they do release, the more signaling that happens, the more mast cell that gets the release, the more signaling that happens. And it's this vicious cycle that patients get into. And so if you've um, heard of any of the work of Beth O'Hara, you'll know her number one treatment for mast cell activation is you have to treat the nervous system first. And I'll get into that more as we go along. So these are the symptoms and findings of mast cell activation of Dr. Lawrence Afrin. Um, and you can see that these symptoms cross all systems in the body. Uh, the gastrointestinal system we know really well um, with all of those digestive symptoms that we often see, but the um, urogenital system, um, you know, that frequent urination is a classic mast cell activation symptom. The musculoskeletal in the joints, fibromyalgia is a classic mast cell activation condition. The neurological part was very new to me, understanding how the nerves get involved. So those frequent headaches, frequent migraines, um, the psychiatric, um, conditions that are associated with mast cell activation, uh, depression, anxiety, hyperactivity. Um, these are all very stressful conditions and so they perpetuate that nerve mast cell activation cycle. Uh, a, a bipolar affective disorder, I have a case study shortly with uh, that as a team. Uh, we had a profound effect that I'll share with you. Uh, they cross the um, endocrine system. Dr. Lawrence Afrin is a hematologist, so he really started to see the hematological um, effect that mast cell was having uh, and the immune system as well. And there's a lot of research now about autoimmunity and mast cell activation, uh, which I won't go down that rabbit hole, but I did doing this presentation, but I'm not going to bore you with that tonight. Um, the constitutional fatigue, chronic fatigue syndrome, it's a classic syndrome occurring when the energy drops out. The skin, the eyes, the ears, the nose, really classically understood, the lungs, uh, the lymphatic system can be involved and the cardiovascular system. And I think for this one with our COVID patients that we're getting all those cardiovascular symptoms. Um, and for me, it makes a lot of sense why those symptoms were occurring now. COVID was calling the mast cells into activation and they were in, um, compromising the vascular integrity of these patients. So uh, this slide is the one that excites me the most. As I was putting this talk together, I was showing this to all my patients. I was going, look, 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 this is what's happening. And um, you know, many of my patients I know are watching this talk. Um, I put this talk together for you and um, so we know well that mast cells have these IgE receptors. It's very well understood. And an antigen binds to it 
and it sets the mast cell off and it releases its symptoms. But what I didn't know and what I learned from Lawrence is that mast cells have corticotropin releasing hormone receptors. So that is the byproduct of the stress response. So if we are stressed, there, there is a potential that we're releasing our contents of our mast cells. Mast cells have benzodiazepine receptors on them. This is Valium's charm. It stabilizes mast cells hence stabilizing the anxiety and the mood. Mm -hmm. They have cannabinoid receptors on them. And this is why CBD is such a powerful mm -hmm. agent and why I love that I'm working in with doctors now who are prescribing this to help my patients with muscle activation. They have toll-like receptors, and this is where we use things like low-dose naltrexone to good effect, but they are covered in vitamin D receptors. Vitamin D is a mast cell stabilizer, and we've got one story of a patient um, who was very, very reactive, very low vitamin D. I think she came in uh, with a vitamin D of 25, and we gave her an intramuscular vitamin D, and all the symptoms switched off. So it's, it's that powerful. Um, they're covered in estrogen receptors. This is why patients are more reactive at certain times in their cycle and less reactive in other times in their cycle. They have leukotriene receptors, which is a byproduct of infection. They have thyroid receptors. They are covered in TSH receptors. And when the TSH docks, it releases T3 and histamine at the same time. And they have melatonin receptors. So and this is how melatonin works, how it helps us induce sleep. It stabilizes the mast cells. Can you see how many pieces of the puzzle are coming together here? Mm -hmm. So how to test for mast cell activation. And I realize there's a lot of patients, I've been looking at this pathology for 25 years going, I just can't explain the ongoing low red blood cell. So you can see high or low red blood cell. You can see high or low ferritin, unexplained anemia, think mast cell activation. You can see high or low platelets. Um, if you do the cytokine panel, we frequently see high interleukin-6, high interleukin-8 and TNF-alpha. Um, you can see high IgE and high eosinophils, but not always. You can see high IgE antibodies and receptors, but not always. You may see raised ECP, which is eosinophilic cationic proteins, but not always. But you may see thyroid, raised thyroid antibodies with none of the classic thyroid symptoms, possibly suspect MCAS. Um, you can test for histamine, tryptase and heparin, but they have an incredibly short half-life. And so they need to be refrigerated right from the centrifuge part and chilled um, during transport, which we don't have a lot of that happening in Australia at the moment. I'm still trying to find labs that will do this for us. So the triggers, and this was the other aha moment. There's generally more than one trigger. So a patient will come in um, having been exposed to mold, Lyme disease or co-infections, and have a lot of MCAS symptoms. Emotional stress will trigger it. They'll get an insect bite and they'll just go into a reaction. Extreme temperatures though, the very first one, is a really classic symptom of MCAS that I was overlooking for a long time. I just didn't understand how that symptom fitted in. So patients that go out in the sun and then just break out in a rash or have a sauna and feel absolutely terrible or are doing the cold bathing and just break out in a rash afterwards or have a hot shower and get a, a rash, a welty rash afterwards. This is an MCAS reaction. Uh, parasitic infection, we'll see the eosinophils raised. Chemicals in personal products can often trip it. Uh, medications, I've put a, a quick list in here for you, can liberate histamine and block DAO, which Jessie's gonna talk all about. Uh, the sodium benzates, common food preservative, uh, common in a lot of um, products. Um, I think Brower is using it in a lot of their homeopathic products. Um, airborne smells and chemicals. These are these patients that can't walk through the perfume aisle or the detergent aisle in the supermarket. Uh, smoke in the environment, people are burning fires, heavy metal toxicity, we've known for a very long time, our mast cell destabilizers. Anesthetics, not well since having surgery, viral infections, herpes and EBV, but with COVID, the new kid on the block, we're seeing a lot more of this in clinic. Food allergies, which I feel are poorly diagnosed at this stage and poorly managed. Um, I think good testing needs to happen around this. 
estrogen excess, how many of our patients with endometriosis, that estrogen excess is just setting off the mast cells in your genital system, creating all the pain and symptoms um, and excipients. So excipients was a big aha for me when Lawrence spoke about it, because these are the patients that can tolerate a little bit of a herb or a little bit of a supplement, and then all of a sudden they react. They felt great for the first two doses and then felt terrible after that. Sometimes it's not the herb or the nutrient that they reacted to, but the excipients in the supplements and medicines in particular. And, you know, we use these because excipients are not meant to be active, but in a mast cell activated patient, they could be causing part of the problem. So the two excipients in particular that I see a lot of problems with are the silica and the magnesium stearate. It's going to work for me. He's not, I'm going to let it go. Got it. Binders, coatings, dyes, flavors, and preservatives all need to be considered. Um, if you've got a patient who was doing well and then not um, with a medication, maybe they got a different brand, maybe they got a generic brand, maybe they got it from a different compounding pharmacy, um, always check back in on the excipients. And it's something I've become really fussy with with my MCAS patients. Okay. Okay, so this is just um, an article from the Journal of Nursing around medications to avoid um, their mast cell liberators. You'd see the anesthetics are there, but some of the uh, anti-infectives, vancomycin, classically known. Patients are like, I never felt worse than when I took that antibiotic. Um, you can see they've published um, some of the environmental triggers down the bottom. They've got infections, latex, interestingly, got published, and emotional stress. So we're really starting to understand the breadth and depth of MCAS now. So a quick case study, um, patient with bipolar affective disorder, and it, more what I want to do is show you how I take a case study now and how complex this is, but when you get all the variables involved, you can really start to mediate them. Um, so MCAS triggers in this patient uh, were his medications. He was doing fine until he had COVID, and then he couldn't tolerate his medications. So what he was doing was he was taking them for two days and stopping for two days, letting the body catch up, and then he'd take them for two days. But the two days he was off the medications were just hell. And it was the excipients in the medications. So whereas he was tolerating them before COVID, he was now not tolerating them after COVID. Uh, stressful events would trigger a uh, bipolar episode, mold in his environment, which he could tolerate that in and of itself, but not with the combination of other triggers. Food allergies, which were unidentified at the time, uh, an extreme vitamin D deficiency, which we gave him an IM vitamin D. Sleep deprivation was massive. He was taking his medications because he couldn't sleep. He believed he hadn't had a proper night's sleep for 10 years. It's a huge neuroinflammatory condition, sleep deprivation and insomnia and infection. As we said, he had COVID. So these were all his trigger lists. His symptoms, which are all classic MCAS symptoms, insomnia, hay fever, sneezing, itching. He took Telfast every day, uh, muscular pain, fatigue, the moon swings, mood swings. We found that he had um, PTSD through his inpatient stay and he actually uh, enlisted the support of the team uh, because he wanted to trial EMDR. Um, he had incredible drilling noise in his head. He was experiencing terrible periodic limb movement disorder, frequent urination, which is another MCAS symptom, and not well since COVID, which we mentioned. So I just more wanted to get these lists up to show you sort of how an MCAS picture presents and the layers that are involved. So other disorders that we commonly see that are connected with mast cell activation, um, all of the connective tissue disorders, hypermobility, all the vascular fragility orders. Uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome um, is very much a mast cell activation condition. The, um, uh, a lot of the digestive conditions, um, but in particular unresolved SIBO, which I've got a case to share with you as well. Uh, the neuropathic conditions, I think a lot of the antipsychotic medications, interestingly, are antihistamines. They have an antihistamine effect. Um, POTS, due to that vascular integrity, uh, SIRS, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, 
um, which you know I've done a lot of work with over the years, and autoimmune conditions. But conditions like endometriosis, fibromyalgia, some cancers, um, they are all mast cell activation syndrome conditions. The mast cells are primary is what I'm thinking, and these conditions are secondary conditions as a result. So this is a great paper on the thyroid and autoimmune and well worth a read, and I'm not going to unpack it for you here, but I just sort of wanted to note this paper um, because it was a really big moment for me understanding the muscles and the endocrine connection that's there. But this is just a little image of the uh, thyroid, healthy thyroid releasing T3 and it docking onto the mast cell and releasing the TSH docking onto the receptor site and releasing T3 and some other thyroid metabolites with it, but also releasing histamine and some of the other contents inside the mast cell. And there is, um, if you have a look at these papers, it does take you down that wormhole of the whole autoimmune presentation. So medications that help to stabilise mast cells. Now, this list came directly from Lawrence's conference, um, but it has a lot of the American products in it. So I've broken this list down and put the Australian equivalents wherever I can. There's only one product I haven't taken across. It's going to work, Jesse. I just wanted to talk about the mast cell inhibitor, I think fourth down, Montelukast. And... Um, this is an old fashioned pediatric medication for asthma. And I, uh, it came to light during COVID um, from the FLCCC. They were suggesting it in the treatment of COVID to help stabilize leukotrienes, um, which is one of the main inflammatory agents with that ongoing COVID infection. Um, and I started to see amazing, amazing results with it. Now, it does have a black box label on it, and some patients can experience depression, uh, and you do need a script for it. But it is a pediatric medication, and there's very few medications that get classified as a pediatric medication. Low doses seem to work very, very well, um, and I've had a lot of patients get incredible success with it, not just for lung and respiratory things, but I've had patients, their period pain's gone. I've had patients, their sinus symptoms have cleared up. Um, their reflux has stopped. So it, wherever you think you've got that leukotriene response, um, potentially due to an infection, Montelukast is definitely uh, well worth considering, but you do need a script for it. So H1 medications, um, uh, they're broken into two classifications. There's first generation and second generation. The first generation have more a sedative effect and they block the histamine receptors <coughs> in the central nervous system. So they kind of just switch everything off. You can get these uh, in the chemist, over the counter. And the second generation are non-sedative. You can also get these over the counter as well. Um, and they are incredibly efficient, effective agents for really just starting to block some of that histamine release into the system, depending on which receptors are being tripped at which time. And quite often with patients, it's more than one receptor being tripped at a time. Um, but these are easy to get. Your H2 medications now need scripts. Some of them used to be on the shelf, but you do need scripts and they're working more uh, for heartburn and reducing stomach acid. Um, and I do see incredible support, um, results with these agents as well, but we get them compounded now. Yeah. <laughs> but these are the ones I really want to talk about. So the mast cell, st st mast cell stabilizing medications. So sodium chromoglycate is Lawrence's favorite one. Um, you can get, uh, can't get nasal spray over the counter, but you can get eye drops over the counter. Um, but tablets and nasal spray both need a script now. Uh, and you do need to start very slowly with this one, especially if patients are very reactive, super careful of the excipients that are in this one. Uh, ketotifen, also a mast cell stabilizer. Oh, sodium chromo doesn't get absorbed, doesn't leave the gut. So it's really just to settle down that mast cell of the digestive system. 
Ketodophen is also a H1 blocker. You can get eye drops over the counter, but you need scripts for tablets. Uh, and it can have a sedative effect as well. So for those patients with insomnia, it can be a nice one to just help switch that sleep pattern back on. Cannabinoids, my favourite. As I said before, the mast cells are covered in cannabinoid receptors. And not only do they downregulate the neurons that are firing that vicious cycle that I was talking about in the beginning, but they regulate the mast cells as well. So they work at both ends of the equation and I've seen incredible results. The trickiest bit with the cannabinoids is getting them prescribed well. A lot of patients respond to the MCT oil um, so getting them in other forms and making sure that you've got the right entourage effect. So you do need to have them well prescribed. And low-dose naltrexone, again, working very much on the toll-like receptors of the gut. You have to start super slow, um, but it can create a little bit more um, tolerance to some food groups if it works. If you've got severe food allergies and you're still consuming those foods that you're very, very reactive to, low-dose naltrexone, doesn't tend to work. So it's a lot about the order with which you do things in as well. So nutrients. Um, quercetin, I think is well known for mast cell stabilizing effect. And there was one study done comparing sodium chromoglycate to quercetin and quercetin actually came out better. I thought that was very interesting. I think with a lot of patients, they're not using high enough doses. 2000 milligrams is actually quite a high dose. Um, but again, I would recommend starting this very slowly and building up to that therapeutic dose and be super careful of the excipients. Green tea, such a simple, easy remedy, two to three cups a day is a beautiful mast cell stabilizer. It's something everybody can do. Um, PEA, another incredible nutrient, uh, has an uh, endocannabinoid-like compound effect. And so it is really working around those uh, cannabinoid receptors, stabilizing the mast cells. Again, uh, dose is usually tricky to get that level of dose. The other thing I love about PEA is it's antiviral. And so if you are dealing with a viral load as well as some of the other triggers, you can kind of hit two birds with one stone, but the viral dose is 2,400 milligrams daily. So it, is, it can be tricky to get those high doses. Chamomile tea, beautiful. The lutein in that is a mast cell stabilizer, one to two cups before bed. That's so simple. Um, DAO, Jessie's going to talk to us more about that, but we're getting amazing results. Uh, patients taking two twice a day with meals, being able to eat food for the first time without pain. Vitamin D we touched on and intravenous vitamin C is another incredible agent that just can switch this mast cell activation off and give the patient a little bit of relief while we're trying to get all our other ducks in a row. The other thing I put in here was um, a paper I wanted to remember to tell you about lactobacillus rhamnosus. Um, and so that paper, it talks about down-regulating uh, the mast cells, that particular probiotic. And I do use that a lot with really good effect. More in kids, I use that one. And herbs. So there's some great herbs for stabilizing mast cells. Vicor skullcap is probably one of the favorite TCM herbs. Um, and Perillia is another beautiful one, it has the lutein in there as well, but it also reduces histamine and it can help with that high TNF alpha uh, metabolite. Nigella, we heard a lot about through COVID, again, reduces that histamine release. Um, but nettle leaf, so simple, H1 antagonist and mast cell stabiliser. But my favourite, favourite one I'm going to jump down to is the magnolia bark because like the CBD, it works on stabilising the neuron as well as the mast cell. And so anything that has that dual action in particular with helping to regulate the nervous system has quite a nice reach. And I have a lot of patients, as soon as we start that one, really start to feel the effects of things settling down. 
So some other things to consider, magnesium. So in particular, quercetin and green tea can block COMT. So if you have a slow COMT, you really need to consider magnesium um, and making sure you've got a good amount, um, particularly to support the liver as well. Zinc is incredibly important <coughs> for mast cell signaling and stress reduction. So I have talked about this and talked about it. So I'm not going to talk about it anymore, but I just want to say um, with the team approach here and certainly with that inpatient, we had, um, we do a lot of nervous system work up front. So we use vagal nerve stimulation, we use bioresonance, we do a lot of craniosacral therapy, we use the acupuncture. Um, Stabilising that nervous system is absolutely paramount to be able to start breaking this cycle. And maintain a schedule mast cells exhibit circadian rhythm patterns so they know it's day they know it's night they know where you are in your cycle they know if you've eaten or if you haven't eaten so really creating a schedule and trying to get that rhythm back going to bed at the same time waking at the same time trying to eat meals at the same time can have a profound effect in treating this condition So a case study on unresolved SIBO. Um, so in this case study, her triggers were sleep deprivation. She uh, was postnatal and had not had a good night's sleep. Uh, I think she was on to her second baby. Uh, she had thyroid dysregulation and had already been taking T3 extract. Um, she had multiple food allergies and these hadn't been diagnosed yet. So she was continuing to consume these foods. Uh, she had unexplained anemia and um, those iron levels being low were really exacerbating everything stress. She was very e easily overwhelmed. So the phone would ring and she would startle. So that whole stress response, she was caught in that nervous system dysregulation. SIBO, she had tried everything to treat it. She had done the antibiotics, uh, the refraximin, she'd done the diets. Um, she'd worked very hard to treat it, but she hadn't identified the food allergies. And then she got COVID and everything got worse. Um, so they were her trigger list. Her pathology is what I wanted to point out with this one. She had a high leptin, which is a cytokine. Um, she had altered ALT, which um, shows up with the liver MCAS picture, interfering with her bile acids, which was exacerbating the SIBO. So if that little line right there was an ongoing driver of SIBO, she had the low ferritin, high ESR, ongoing infection, calling the mast cells out, and that thyroid, which she had been taking the T3 extract for nine years. So I just wanted to show you a treatment pattern, uh, protocol for her. The sodium chromoglycate, we started to just really try and settle down all the mast cell activity, but we had to start at super slow. I actually started it at 25 milligrams and I got her to open the cap and just mix it in a little bit of warm water and just sip it through the day. And then we slowly took it up. The low dose naltrexone we started, but she actually re started reacting to that. And that's when I suspected there was some food allergies that she was consuming um, and so we've had to pause that one for now. Uh, we started her on the DAO class, and it was the first time that she could eat food without extreme cramping and pain. So it had a significant improvement. Jessie can explain why in a minute. Uh, we put her on uh, a product that had magnolia in it, and I got her just to take one sort of frequently throughout the day to really help that stress response, MCAS. And she already had the CBD oil, um, but she wasn't taking enough. So we got the dose up and we got her taking it twice a day. And I think with CBD um, and medical cannabis, it's really a big part of it. Most patients I come across have tried it, but they haven't quite got the dose right. But they haven't quite got the formula right. And we popped her on a low histamine diet. But the other things we did simultaneously, so we worked on the, limb, um, the lipid system and got her doing some craniosacral therapy. We really did a lot of education around her window of tolerance um, and getting her nervous system fitness up. And we got her meditating and doing breath work, which both she found profoundly beneficial. So MCAS and histamine. Over to you, Jessie. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Jessie. I am a clinical nutritionist here at the Health Lodge. 
Um, I've been working quite closely with Ren recently in the management of some of her um, or our MCAS patients. And um, tonight I'm just going to be talking about a couple of nutritional tools that we've used to manage these patients and kind of the mechanism behind it regarding DAO enzymes and the breakdown of histamine. So, um, like I said, DAO enzymes are the primary uh, enzyme that um, degrades histamine. So, the primary functions of DAO enzymes are regulating histamine levels in the body and supporting gut health and modulating immune function. Um, with the diagram here on the right, the HMT pathway is kind of the non-preferred pathway. It's more so liver histamine. And then the main pathway here is the DAO, which um, is more that uh, gastrointestinal sy system. And it's the yeah, predominant pathway of degrading histamine. Um, the important thing to note is if there is an imbalance or surplus between ingested histamine and histamine released from storage cells like mast cells, and the lack of ability to then degrade this. So um, if there's a DAO enzyme deficiency, which a lot of people do have, um, this can lead to an accumulation of histamine in the plasma, which can then trigger adverse health reactions. Um, when there are excessive levels of histamine in the body, DAO enzymes become incredibly overwhelmed and basically cease functioning. Um, this has similar repercussions to those who have DAO enzyme deficiency. So it leads, leads to that accumulation. Um, once we provide the enzymes with a break from histamine, with like the low histamine diet or DAO um, enzyme supplementation, the DAO enzymes are able to replenish and um, function effectively again. So when a person is susceptible to histamine intolerance, possibly or possibly DAO deficient, their histamine bucket's potentially already quite full. So this is seen in those maybe who've been living in mould or um, so, yeah, so when a person's susceptible to histamine intolerance or possibly <coughs> DAO deficient, or their histamine bucket's already quite full, which we see a lot with um, patients that have been living in mold or have got SIRS or MCAS, um, and then they continue to consume high histamine foods, it can really overwhelm these DAO enzymes. Um, and then it leads again to that firm, uh, further accumulation of histamine in the body. So it comes that really toxic cycle. So here on the diagram, um, in a healthy individual, we've got the histamine here crossing the gastrointestinal wall. These little green bits are the DAO enzymes. So this is what um, degrades histamine and it only allows a certain amount of histamine to enter the bloodstream. Whereas when we have an excessive amount of histamine um, and this can really overwhelm our DAO enzymes and then they stop kind of latching onto the histamine and a lot of them, a lot of the histamines can then enter the bloodstream. So this leads to that accumulation of serum um, histamine. And then those with histamine intolerance, which is kind of the next phase, is um, you can see here these DAO enzymes are unable to bind to any histamine because um, they're completely overwhelmed. So the same amount of histamine that's being ingested is what's entering the bloodstream. That's why those enzymes are so helpful. Um, by reducing the high intake, the intake of high histamine foods, it can really help um, decrease the overall histamine load in the body. So it's reducing the load on these DAO enzymes and then allowing the breakdown of this histamine excess. So this is the term replenishment. The low histamine diet may also include a lot of foods that have these DAO supportive um, cofactors or co-nutrients. So things like vitamin C, vitamin D, B6, copper, magnesium, zinc, and phosphorus. Um, so these nutrients are involved in the production and activity of DAO enzymes and supporting the function to break down histamine. But some patients may also like to supplement these as cofactors to support their body in, in producing their own DAO enzymes. Alternatively, DAO supplementation is also an option. Um, we've started using it regularly in clinic, which can have the same effect on the endogenous DAO enzymes, so the DAO enzymes that are already in our body, um, which can, it's basically reducing the demand on them. So then it's kind of um, sparking their activity again. Um, so when we think about the low histamine diet, the main aims, therapeutic aims about are to reduce foods high in histamine and biogenic amines. We're reducing the foods that trigger the release of histamine in the body, and we're reducing the foods that inhibit DAO enzyme activity, which are generally foods that are high histamine anyway, and um, overall just focusing on increasing uh, DAO enzyme activity. So these are the main therapeutic goals. So the diet is used as a therapeutic approach for many other conditions as well that are triggered by histamine response or where histamine is the main culprit in the pathogenesis or manifestation of a condition like 
um, urticaria, eczema, psoriasis, PMDD, um, MCAS, etc. But due to the diet's restriction, prescribing a low histamine diet is can be incredibly overwhelming, um, especially for those that are suffering from complex, complex chronic health conditions. Um, so rather than just providing a handout, it's an integral uh, part of the process is to making sure that you're reviewing the patient's diet together and making adjustments accordingly. So this not only gives them a clear idea of what to eat when they get home, so they don't feel too restricted or overwhelmed, but um, it also, of course, improves compliance. Not overwhelmed, but we're trying to mediate it as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, here are a couple of studies that measure the correlation between the low histamine diet and the increase in Dow enzyme activity. So in patients with symptoms triggered by histamine-rich food, measuring the serum Dow activity can help subjects who uh, help identify subjects who could benefit from supplementation or the low histamine diet, or both. Um, so the diet's been found to have a significant impact on increasing Dow enzyme activity, but the question is how long is the diet necessary? Most studies I've found have only been done for it. Most studies I've found have been done for a four to eight week time period that have had major benefit. There's no major difference that I've found in enzyme activity from weeks eight to 12. So this suggests that the continual continuation of the diet doesn't necessarily correlate with an, a continual increase in enzyme activity. Mm. Of course, individual responses can vary, but eight weeks is a general time frame that I put um, clients on for a low histamine diet. As evidence suggests, this is just perfectly enough time to significantly improve their um, enzyme activity. And then this uh, study on the right here, I found really interesting. So it's done on 100 people with chronic health problems and 35% of them were found to have low Dow activity. So I feel like that's a really kind of highlighting factor of how much histamine, Dow enzymes and mast cells are a missing piece of the puzzle when it comes to complex chronic health conditions. Mm, beautiful. Um, so just bringing it all together now with uh, mast cell activation syndrome and how the low histamine diet can really support this kind of patient. It can provide immediate symptomatic relief. So reducing um, that load of histamine and trigger foods but it can also aid in the process of long-term histamine clearance. So clearing that um, serum histamine by reactivating or replenishing their Dow enzymes. It can also help identify that individual, that client's individual histamine threshold. So this is very different for everyone. Some people can tolerate bananas, some people can't. Some people can tolerate avocado, some people can't. It's very different, which kind of comes back to that um, histamine bucket. Mm -hmm. um, each person is full different to a different level. Um, but it also helps identify their unique food triggers that may require long-term avoidance and then eventual reintroduction um, later on down the track. Um, it can also be a very safe diet to return to in mast cell flares. So um, people who have kind of got back on top of their mast cells, but um, potentially have are exposed to mold or incredibly stressful event or have um, just been exposed to COVID and then have this complete mast cell flare again, they know that they can somewhat manage their uncomfortability by returning to um, the mast, the low histamine diet. Um, so when we think about using food as medicine for mast cell activation syndrome, like I said, everyone is so different, um, but here are a list of foods that can support depending on the individual, um, focusing on low histamine and vitamin C and antioxidant rich fruits like berries, berries especially, um, rhubarb, star fruit, lychee, mangosteen, pomegranate, and vegetables like asparagus, beet greens, uh, bok choy, cucumber, dandelion, snow peas, et cetera. The list is quite large. Um, Aquacetin rich foods, of course, which is like apples, onion, garlic, and ginger is a beautiful muscle stabilizing food. Mm. That's great. So stabilizing the immune system and reducing inflammation is a critical part of treating this condition. Uh, there's two other things that I just really want to touch on briefly, and that is when you're treating mast cell activation, uh, you need to check for underlying infections. So uh, infections like H. pylori, Epstein-Barr virus, the herpes virus, because they're all going to signal to the immune system to release mast cells. That's their job. That's the mast cells working correctly in the body um, and treating gut dysbiosis. So if there is, you know, a, a bacterial or a parasitic overgrowth, you know, it's one of the first areas where we really connected 
the mast cell activation and um, parasites. And um, so really looking for those and treating those. If you've got them underlying, they're just going to keep tripping the uh, mast cells to release their contents into the system. Um, and probiotics like lactobacillus rhamnosus are fantastic in those cases. Thank you. So things to keep in mind, there'll always be more than one trigger. It won't just be mold or it won't just be infection or it won't just be a food. Um, it'll be, as I showed in those two case studies, there'll usually be five or six or even seven triggers. Um, the symptoms will come and go is another classic telltale that it's mast cell activation, depending on where they are in their cycle, um, depending on what mast cells are being activated due to what environmental exposure or food. Um, there'll always be a tipping point, and I think COVID has been a lovely example of that. We've had patients that we've had stable, not heard from for years, and then all of a sudden they've resurfaced after COVID, and they're like, I don't know what happened. It just all came back. Um, you'll need to try a number of treatments to mediate the mast cells. And it's a lot around the right treatments at the right time. And Lawrence talks a lot about um, patients getting fatigue, trying things and going, well, that didn't work. And, and um, so, it, and it could be that it was the right thing, but at the wrong time, like I said, with my other patient with the low dose naltrexone, we've had to stop that because we haven't identified, my guess is we've got some foods that she's highly, highly reactive to that have not been identified yet, even though we've been on the low histamine diet. Um, if treatments aren't working, there's probably an unidentified trigger and always treat the stress response first. Yeah, if you want to do any further listening, uh, look up Beth O'Hara and she talks a lot firsthand um, about her journey into mast cell activation and the stress response was absolutely paramount in treating that. Um, and active infections always need addressing as a priority as well. So that is the end of our talk. Team, is there any burning questions that you've got? Or thoughts or comments? Anything that you want to add? Um, I guess what I also want to say is that, um, you know, this is a team approach that it's not sort of just me working this information out on my own. This, this, it's an accumulation of information. His, our beautiful team here at the Health Lodge, Friday night, um, learning together. We love doing this stuff. Um, is there any questions, thoughts, comments? I saw the blueberries were on this low histamine, but they're kind of high histamine as well, aren't they? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, um, so with some foods, they can be mast cell stabilising, but, um, but also slightly high in histamine. So the mast cell stabilising component can be more effective than the histamine in the food. Mm -hmm. And some patients, if they're allergic to blueberries, quite often if I run a food allergy panel and blueberries will come up super, super high, then we know it shouldn't use that food for its mast cell stabilising effect. So it is a little more nuanced than just, yes, eat blueberries, no, don't eat blueberries. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's where you need a good clinical nutritionist on your team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anything else? Mm -hmm. Anybody else? No? I just found it so interesting about the excipients or medications even that some patients um, are better for for one or two weeks mm. and then everything goes um, back to back to what it was. So that's very interesting. And you see Thank that you. in clinic too. I do. Yeah. 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 It was a big aha moment for me. Yeah. Okay. You know, the thing I found interesting as a <clears throat> psychologist as we talk about the uh, nervous system Mm -hmm. regulating or dysregulating uh, also the nervous system being having a neuroceptive match or mismatch to its environment but in this talk you're talking about cells regulating or dysregulating or having a neuroceptive mismatch to what it's trying to address which is um, infections or, or what it perceives as an attack on the body and yeah. these mast cells get jumping into action when they actually shouldn't be exactly yeah, yeah. so that's really interesting that anxious predisposition yeah mm -hmm. yeah no one else yeah big awakening for me too mm -hmm. anybody else mm -hmm. we'll leave it there okay thank you very much everyone for joining us uh email us your questions and um we'll respond uh yep beautiful thanks oscar <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you everyone Bye.